So last week I sort of misspoke when I said that, at the retreat I mean, when I said that for August we'd be diving into the meekness um, of Jesus. Um, there was some confusion between some, some docs that the eldership shares as far as um, planning out the year's arcs and stuff. So um, this month is actually a broader, uh, broader than that. And uh, over the next few weeks we'll be exploring the humanity of Christ in general and becoming more grounded in um, that aspect of him. Uh, I say it wasn't a total misspeak because um, his meekness is definitely uh, a part of that when we're talking about what kind of man he was. So um, more on that later, I guess. Um, so the humanity of Christ. What does that mean? First uh, John says this, 1 through 14. In the beginning, the word already existed. The word was with God, and the word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him, and nothing was created except through him. The word gave life to everything that was created, and his life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. God sent a man, John the Baptist, to tell about the light so that everyone might believe because of his testimony. John himself was not the light. He was simply a witness to tell about the light. The one who is the true light, who gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He came into the very world he created, but the world didn't recognize him. He came to his own people, and even they rejected him. But to all who believe him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn, not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. So the word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness, and we have seen his glory the glory of the Father's one and only Son. It says, the Word became human and made his home among us. The word sarx is used um, here. For those of you with a lexicon handy, you'll know that it's used over a hundred times, um, definitely over a hundred times throughout the New Testament, and you'll find the meaning of the word is exactly as it translates to us, human, flesh, the soft substance of the living body which covers the bones and is permeated um, with blood of both man and beast. The body, the body of a man, used of natural or physical origin, generation or relationship. The sensuous nature of a man, the animal nature, without any suggestion of depravity. Uh, the physical nature of man is subject to suffering as a living creature. The flesh, you know, it's mere human nature, etc. Um... This is the Greek word that's used here when it says the word became human. It's important to know that the very topic of his humanity was debated for hundreds of years after Jesus' life and death. Uh, we can't be good um, apologists, as we're learning to be this year, if we don't um, have somewhat of a background of that, where it all started. It wasn't until 451 A.D. that an ecumenical or worldwide council was held, um, the biggest at the time, it was like something about, something like 500 bishops attended, um, and it was called the Council of Chalcedon, and it set in stone um, the doctrine of Christ's nature, that he is both fully God and fully man. This was in contrast to the main heresy at the time, Nestorianism, um, a belief led by, you could probably guess, a man named Nestorius, uh, the belief here was that the human and divine person of God was separate. Specifically, Nestorius um, had an issue with Mary and the mother of God terminology that's used. But uh, the Council of Ephesus in 431, so 20 years prior, and finally the Council of Chalcedon would lay uh, to rest this heresy um, by officially declaring what is known as the Chalcedonian Creed. And you're like, what? So what this says... Follow with me. It's, it's sort of epic in its wording, but it can be confusing, but I'll um, simple it, or I'll, I'll dumb it down. Sorry, I'll dumb it down for you guys at the end. But it is worded in a really specific and um, uh, way that le uh, gives no room for confusion, I guess. This is the easiest way I could say that. The Chalcedonian Creed says this. We then, following the Holy Fathers, all with one consent teach people to confess one and the same Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, the same perfect in Godhead and also perfect in manhood, truly God and truly man, 
of a reasonable or rational soul and body, consubstantial or coessential with the Father according to the Godhead, and consubstantial or coessential with us according to the manhood, in all things like unto us, without sin, begotten before all ages of the Father according to the Godhead, and in these latter days for us and for our salvation, born of the Virgin Mary, the mother of God, according to the manhood, one and the same Christ, Son, Lord, only begotten, to be acknowledged in two natures, inconfusedly, unchangeably, indivisibly, and inseparably, the distinction of natures being by no means taken away by the union, but rather the property of each nature being preserved, and concurring in one person and one subsistence, or hypostasis, not parted or divided into two persons, but one and the same Son, and only begotten God, the Word, the Lord Jesus Christ, as the prophets from the beginning have declared concerning him, and the Lord Jesus Christ himself has taught us, and the creed of the Holy Fathers, the creed the Holy Fathers has handed down to us. What this basically means, in case you had a hard time following, like I said, is that Christ is both God and man having all the attributes belonging to both deity and humanity at the very same time. Jesus is truly God in every way and, it's also, and is also a real human being in every, sense of the, in every sense of the word with the exception of sin, as we know. Uh, the things he experienced as a man did not affect the integrity of his deity. Are you with me? Okay. There's a lot more um, political and power play, I guess, issues during the time of the Council of Chalcedon, but I would urge you, if you're interested in learning more about it, to research it yourself or ask Pastor Monty or an elder uh, about it, because I'm sure, for example, Pastor Monty would love to talk to you about that history. That's his thing. Um, at least now you have a little bit of a nugget of the context that this, this issue that we're talking about this month is one that was debated for even hundreds of years after Christ's death let alone the, you know, 1,500 more since then. Uh, remember that this, top, this year's top uh, topic, or whatever, point is about being faithful and grounded. And so the purpose of this month and the humanity of um, Christ is that we have a thorough understanding in case anyone tries to diminish that, diminish the value or the nature of Christ's humanity um, or his manhood. Yeah, his manhood. If Jesus was anything less than fully man, then his perfect sacrifice to us as a sinless man would not be significant. As it's stated in the Levitical laws in Levit Leviticus 22, do not bring anything with a defect because it will not be accepted on your behalf. And because he is also fully God, his sacrifice is eternal. Because he is fully God, who is infinite, we can understand that uh, this allows him to be both things simultaneously. Fully God and fully man without compromising either part of, his, um, of who he is. Not two different persons, but two natures united into one person. Uh, to quote James White, I was watching a debate uh, this week. We must harmonize all of the revelation of the New Testament if we're to have a clear understanding of the nature of Christ, divine and human. And human he was. So this week, I simply want to establish the basics of um, Jesus' humanity, meaning the things that we um, define as being a physical person and how we know he was an actual physical person in real space and real time. Some of these things may seem like a rehash of what we've already gone through in previous sermons. Remember that we're taking different um, topics each month and coming at it from a little bit different angle each time, even if there's overlap, it's important to know that the filter, like there's different filters for understanding the same thing, and that's the beauty of God and Christ. Um, so yeah, they might seem like a rehash, or they might seem even silly, but they are nonetheless relevant and important for knowing um, that the physical man, the fully man Jesus, was just that, a person with flesh and blood, and sens senses and perceptions and, um, yeah, all of it, the same as you and me. So, to start, we have his incarnation or his birth. 
not to be confused with um, the inception of Mary, which we know was um, by the Holy Spirit, but the physical birth. Mary's birth of Christ was by all accounts, and as recorded in Scripture, the same physical birth um, as any other child at the time. Luke 2, 7 says that after he was born, he was wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, and laid him, and they laid him in a manger, the same they would have done um, any other child, the same as even we see things like that today. Um, if you've ever been a part of childbirth, um, you'll know that one of the most common things is that once the baby is born, it's usually taken and swaddled or wrapped and then given to the mom or whatever. You see the same thing recorded in scriptures for Christ. Um, our eight pound, three ounce baby Jesus. Um, we have the genealogy. Today people um, pay a lot of money to trace their family lines, for example, to see who their great grandparents were, to see what kind of physical ailments they or their children might be predisposed to. Um, to see how closely related they are to Kevin Bacon, you know what I'm saying? Six degrees to Kevin Bacon. Uh, an anthropology professor at the University of Michigan um, was quoted as saying that genealogy is said to be America's second most favorite hobby. People are all about tracing that. I don't know what the first is, but he said it's a very popular thing. And I know that, at least in Haven, a couple people have paid to have that traced. Um, I'm sure that you guys know people or yourselves have done the same. Uh, it's something that's seen as a um, respected and clear way to find the truth or, or something significant about who we are. And so likewise, the genealogy of Jesus should be considered and respected um, as it also links him to his humanity. In the book of Luke, his family is traced all the way back to Adam. Luke 3, uh, 23 to through 38. Uh, Jesus was born, Jesus was the son of Joseph. Joseph was the son of Heli. Heli was the son of Mathat, the son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. Uh, and I'm sure that when you come to that point in scripture, you might just skip all the way because you get it. You know, he comes from a long line of people, but you should see. It's a long line of people. Um, if you've ever counted, I counted, it's 76 generations of people. Um, his family line consists of human beings, actual people in actual history, uh, many of whom the Bible speaks in great length even about. 76 different generations of people, though. I've never heard of an argument against that, for example, um, about the validity of, of those huge lines of people. I don't know if it's because people are too lazy and I don't want to have to debunk 76 different generations of people or something, but... Um, usually they just want to say, oh, scripture, they want to throw out scripture completely, or they just want to attack Christ, but if we're going to take scripture, we have to take it um, and take all of it, as James White says. Uh, there's also the fact that he had an actual family, um, himself, Mary, Joseph, his brothers, James, Joseph, and Jude, and Simon, and his sisters. His birth um, through that specific line of people uh, as the prophets foretold about, and his own immediate family reinforce and corroborate um, the truth of Jesus' physical nature, his humanity. He's tied to multiple generations of people just like we are. And so when we're talking about his humanity, we should consider that, just like we consider our own lines to find out things about who we are. We have his physical maturation, how he matured. Uh, his maturation was consistent with his peers and with what we know and see even today. For example, we have recorded in Scripture his circumcision and as a baby, eight days after his birth, and his dedication at the temple. Luke 2, 21. Eight days later, when the baby was circumcised, he was named Jesus, the name given him, the name given him by the angel even before he was conceived. Then it was time for their purification offering, as required by the law of Moses after the birth of a child. So his parents took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. The law of the Lord says, if a woman's first child is a boy, he must be dedicated to the Lord. So they offered the sacrifice required. Consistent with any other person during that time, they followed through with the same thing. Um, 
Chapter 2 of Luke concludes with verse 52, saying Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and all the people. The Greek word to describe his growth here is uh, literally meant to describe the physical aging or in reference to a physical attribute of Christ, same as used in Luke 19 and John 9. The man Jesus wasn't a baby. You know, it wasn't a snap of a finger type thing. He wasn't a baby, then all of a sudden he's a man, and that's the story we're given of Christ in, in the Bible. Um, he grew and matured physically from an infant to a boy teaching the temple, for example, um, into adolescence and then to man. 30 years of physical maturity taking place in his life. Um, scripture makes certain to detail certain checkpoints so that we know um, <clears throat> so that we know this. And the summary statement of his early years uh, again testifies to the humanity of just this, of Jesus being a real person. We have, um, along with his birth, his genealogy, and his physical maturation, we have the multitude of physical interactions of Christ and sensations even. Jesus experienced through his life things that any real person has the capacity to experience. Um, the same sensations that we experience today. The people and Jesus of 2,000 years ago uh, weren't special in that regard. Um, and Jesus being fully man wasn't immune to these things either. For example, Jesus physically interacted. We know this. It's recorded all through the Gospels. <clears throat> uh, Matthew 4, Matthew 8, when he heals the man with leprosy and the sicknesses and um, casts out demons. Matthew 9, when he hears the paralyzed man or the bleeding woman who touches his robe. He heals the blind men. Matthew 12, uh, when he heals a deformed hand. Matthew 14, when he feeds the 5,000. And again in Matthew, when he feeds the 4,000. Um, Matthew 15, when he heals the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mutes, etc. Matthew 19, when he blesses the children. And Matthew 26, when he takes the communion with his disciples. There's countless recorded uh, instances in Scripture that testify to the fact of his humanity. We could sit here and comb through the Gospels to see, but I think the point is there. It's recorded clear. Um, whether he was help healing people, feeding the people, teaching the people. I didn't even talk about the many different times where he's just teaching, not physically touching. Uh, he was in physical contact and communion with his people. He wasn't a phantom. He wasn't, um, what's their names? Will. Will and Barb in the upside down, you know, where he couldn't, like, he was there, but he wasn't there, you know? You guys watch Stranger Things? Okay, so I got about a handful of you. You know, they're in an alternate dimension, so they can see what's going on, but they can't, you know, touch and talk and stuff. That wasn't Christ. He was physically there, physically present, and physically interacting. You should watch Stranger Things, man. Especially you, Pastor Monty. <laughs> uh, John will appreciate that Jesus sweat uh, in Luke 22. And we talked about it earlier in the year uh, when he's praying at the garden. It says that his, Jesus was in such agony that he began to sweat um, with the tinge of blood, you know? And we talked about it, like I said, in the year. That's a real medical phenomenon. Um, Jesus hungered. <clears throat> Let's see, in Matthew 4, verse 2, in the wilderness, uh, he fasted and became very hungry for 40 days and 40 nights, it says. Uh, Jesus thirsted, John 19, verse 28. Jesus, this is when he was on the cross, obviously. Jesus knew that his mission was now finished, and to fill scripture, he said, I am thirsty, fulfilling the prophecies of Psalms 22 and 69. Um, Again in John 4, I believe it's at the well with the Samaritan woman when he's asking her for a drink. Um, Jesus grew tired and needed sleep. Same scripture, John 4, he sat down because he was exhausted at the well, Jacob's well. Again in Mark 4, verse 35 through 38. Uh, as evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross to the other side of the lake. So they took Jesus in the boat, started out, leaving the crowds behind. 
Uh, but soon a fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat, and he began to fill with water. Jesus was sleeping at the back with his head on a cushion. Jesus slept, just like we sleep. Jesus felt pain. Uh, John 19, when he was flogged um, with a whip, when he had a, thorn, a crown of thorns on, put on his head, we talked about uh, during the Easter service, I think I talked about it, what that process was probably like for him. And, you know, that movie, uh, whatever, Passion, sort of gives us an uh, illusion into what that would have been like for him. Um, and it's graphic. And he f- would have felt all the physical sensations of that uh, passion that he went through. Jesus cried, uh, John 11, when he wrote, John 11. Yes, just before raising Lazarus, says Jesus wept. He also wept when he was on his return to Jerusalem because he knew what it meant for the city. Jesus died a physical death. Again, we talked about the death um, in great detail during Easter down to how he more than likely died. Remember, he would have suffocated because of the way he was hung. Jesus felt all these physical, physical sensations just the same as us. That's what makes his humanity so significant for us. Because we know that what he went through, we also go through. The scriptures are united and consistent in their testimony to the genuine humanity of him. There's never any indication given that he was somehow um, non-human or a phantom, like I said, in the upside down, or any purely spiritual being. He came down and lived among us physically and experienced all of what that includes for us. Um, he hungers, thirsts, tires, cries just like we do. His pain was our pain, or our pain was his pain, rather. He wasn't given any special immunity from all these things, as I said. His physical death was for us so that we can live. If Jesus wasn't fully man, why would God allow these details about the man Jesus to be recorded for our benefit? Why would we care that Jesus got hungry or thirsty or tired. Why would we need to know that? It's there for a reason, so that we can know the significance of him living that physical life and then dying on our behalf. Um, the fact is that they're crucial in our understanding of God and his grace, grace in giving us his son, who was connected to us on a physical level. As I said, the fact that Jesus' humanity was real is made clear by the entirety of Scripture. The New Testament specifically gives us a comprehensive and thorough examination of the man and his makeup, and it's here that over the next couple weeks we'll dive more into the nature of his humanity and his character and the effect that his character had physically. The true reality of the humanity of the man must be at the foundation of our conception or um, understanding of who he is as God and fully man. So, questions for discussion briefly this week is, what is it about Christ's physical nature that you appreciate the most? How does knowing that Jesus was a real person, a real man, play a significant part in your relationship with God? Why is it important to keep Jesus' manhood intact? Why does it need defending How does the world try and diminish the nature of Christ and his physical, um, yeah, his physical nature? These are the things we can discuss now.